All right. One more time. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the um, Power Systems Virtual User Group um, webinar. And I'm Joe Armstrong, uh, and I run these things every month. So um, we've got a lot of stuff to cover today. And um, a couple of things before we get started. First, the presentation materials are on the wiki. And uh, we'll put a, a link to the wiki in the chat uh, at some point here. And um, so the charts are on the wiki. A link to the replay will be on the wiki um, after probably tomorrow or something like that, after I get it downloaded and, and everything. So I am recording this session. I've turned the recording button on. Uh, we have two panels in the WebEx. If you haven't, uh, if you're not too familiar with this, there's a chat panel and a Q&A panel. Feel free to chat all you want. If you have questions um, for the panel, for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A panel. That's the one that we'll really be monitoring. So um, today we're going to talk about dynamic capacity on IBM Power Systems. Uh, we're really going to give an overview uh, of uh, various aspects of dynamic capacity. We'll concentrate a little bit more on one of them. And um, you get to listen to me for a good share of it, so I'll be uh, doing most of the presenting here. I have pulled in a couple of people. Stephanie Jensen and Michael Caranta uh, are going to help along, and, and I'll kind of tell more about what they're going to talk about when we get to those sessions, sections. Um, also, we've got uh, a colleague of mine, Tom Prokop, and uh, all three of those are going to be in the background kind of answering questions and probably um, correcting all the mistakes I make along the way here. So we've got a lot of stuff to cover today, so I, I, let's get going. Um, on the other hand, we've got one announcement first. I have to remember this, um, and that is um, in the past I've talked about AIX training and certification, that it was coming, so I want to announce that it is here today. Now you can do AIX training and get an AIX certification. Uh, this particular chart's in my deck that you can download from the wiki, so the links and stuff are on here. Uh, I know I've been contacted in the past um, by people asking for this, uh, Maria Ward, who's our AIX offering manager, has told me now it's available, and she gave me this chart. So go ahead, and if, if you're interested in this, you can download that. And um, up in the upper corner here, you can see the new AIX um, logo, and I haven't that incorporated that into the uh, the VUG logo, but uh, that's the new AIX logo apparently. So let's get going. All right. So. Um, IBM's been, you know, has a, really a long history of virtualization and innovation and, and um, adding capacity in a non-disruptive way. So it's very flexible. We've, um, over the years, developed lots of different ways of doing this. And um, some of them uh, aren't as, I'll say, have been eclipsed by others now. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> so our agenda today, we're going to talk about capacity on demand. Um, there's various flavors of capacity on demand. Um, this is really the start of it. Then we're going to talk about Power Enterprise Pools, and then uh, 1.0, and then we'll talk about Power Enterprise Pools, um, PEP, which we refer to it as PEP 2.0, also now called Power Private Cloud with Shared Utility Capacity. I'll refer to it probably just as PEP 2.0, just because it's easier. And then uh, Michael's going to tell us about a PEP sizing tool, and then Stephanie is going to go over a, the cloud management uh, console, which you'll hear about, and uh, she'll do a demo of that. So uh, most of this uh, applies to, I'll just start out by saying, most of this applies to what we call our scale-up systems. Okay, So these are our larger systems, our enterprise systems, all words that we use for that. Um, there are some things that refer also to the scale-out system. So if you're running on a smaller system, don't go away. We've got some cool stuff to talk about um, with that as well. Um, on the bottom of this chart, you can see the, what I put the link here is the Capacity on Demand User Guide. So if you go to this link, you can download the Capacity on Demand User Guide. Um, it will give you more information about um, all these things here. So let's um, get on to this. So Capacity on Demand, as I said, uh, this refers to our scale-up systems. In, in our scale-up systems, you buy processors and memory, and you pay for the processors and memory, and then you have a separate charge where you pay for activation of those processors and memory. So you might buy a system that has 40 cores in it, all right, and a terabyte of memory, and you activate only 20 cores and maybe 512 gigabytes of memory. So you don't have to activate everything, and there's separate charges um, for that. So 
this is really, like I said, on our, on our scale up systems. Um, started back in P5. Now, I've listed in this particular chart just the Power 7, Power 8, and Power 9 systems that offer that. I didn't bother to put in the P5 and P6 systems. But it's available on our scale up or our enterprise class systems. Why would you buy capacity that you don't activate? Because if they're not activated, you can't use them. All right, they're not giving you that processor power. You can't allocate that memory to some um, some LPAR. So there's a few reasons why you might do this. One is you might buy a system that you're going to use for you know three, four, five years, and you buy it with a certain capacity that's going to support your growth over those years. But you don't want to pay for all that capacity up front. You can buy, like I say, a, a 40 core system, activate 20 cores of it, and then as your workload grows, you can buy more capacity and add it to that system. Now the, the hardware is already there, so when you buy this other capacity, you use you you can activate it, and there's no downtime. All right, it's 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 there, and you can put in the code, you activate it, and you can use it right at the time. So there's it's non-disruptive. So that's one reason you might. Another reason is, as we'll see, these these dark cores, these non-active cores, you can use them for small amounts of time and pay less if you're using them only for a small amount of time, and we'll talk about that. And then also, there's some RAS characteristics that you get out of this. <clears throat> so if you have um, RAS is reliability, availability, and serviceability. So let's say you have your systems running along and a core fails. All right. Well, if you have a dark core, that will automatically activate, and you can keep running at your full capacity with, with a failed core. Or the same thing with a memory. If a DIMM fails, then that memory will activate, and you can keep running with your full capacity of, of memory that you need on that system. And then later in the future, you schedule a downtime that's more convenient for you to actually fix your problem so that, so that you, know, you, you get it taken care of. But you're not running with reduced capacity. So there's some benefits for doing this. And, and we have different types of capacity on demand. So the first one, kind of the most basic, is capacity upgrade on demand. And that's when you permanently activate some non-activated resource. So you have your 20 cores. You decide, oh, I need a couple more cores for this workload. It's grown a little bit. So you, you contact your seller, whether it's your business partner or the IBM or if you're buying it direct. Contact them. You say, I need two more cores activated on the system. They do what we call an MES on the system. You get codes. You enter them into your HMC. And those, those resources, whether it's cores or memory, become active, and then you can allocate them to an LPAR. And that's permanent capacity upgrade on demand. We also have trial capacity upgrade on demand. And that's where you get to use some resources, no charge for 30 days. <clears throat> so we have two ways of doing this. And, and actually, trial COD, I think, should be called like lifeboat or maybe lifesaver COD because in my experience, somebody calls me at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. They say, hey, Joe, um, this weekend we need some extra cores on this particular system for whatever reason. We've got a PO. It's not going to go through. How do we do this? We're, we're just going to die if we don't. And um, I send them to the trial capacity on demand website, and you can um, get a 30 days. It usually takes a few hours. You get the codes, and you can activate um, some resources. So there's two types of trial COD. There's regular or exception. In a regular trial COD, you can activate two cores and or four gig of memory, or you can get eight cores and or 64 gig of memory. There's some different options in there. And you get them for 30 days. And then after those 30 days are done, if you buy a core, if you activate permanently activate a core, or you permanently activate some memory, it resets that, and you can do that trial again. You get another 30 days. All right. In the exception trial COD, it lights up all the unactivated cores and or memory. There's, there's, you do them separately. But everything in the system that's not active becomes active. Okay, so your whole system, everything's active in it, and you get that for 30 days. Now, what happens in the end of both of these, when the end of 30 days is done, you have to deallocate those, those resources from whatever partitions you put them on, and then they get reclaimed by the system. Okay, that's what you sign up to do. If you don't do that, if you don't take them off of, of that LPAR, they don't just disappear, all right? So IBM doesn't do that to you. Now, you're probably in violation of, of your contract that you signed to do this, but they will stay there and they'll keep running until either you take them off or if you reboot that partition, when it comes back up, they'll, they'll be gone. All right? So you don't want to be in a situation where that might happen. So that's trial COD. 
Now, we also have elastic and utility COD, and I'm going to talk about those with some more charts. So I'm not really going to talk about those right now. But I do want to make one other note about factory deconfiguration of cores. And this is a loophole. So as I mentioned, so far everything we've talked about really refers to just scale-up systems, all right, the, our larger enterprise systems. With the scale-out systems, there's a little loophole, and it's called factory deconfiguration of cores. When you buy scale-out systems and you buy a core, there isn't a separate charge for the activation of core. All the charges are rolled into one. When you buy your system, all the cores are active, all the memory is active by default. But you can say when you order the system, you can factory deconfigure some cores, all right? So the cores are there. You've paid for them. You've paid for the activation, but the software you're not paying for. And I see this used actually fairly often on smaller systems that are IBM I shops, okay? So they have workload. It uses one or two cores. We don't have a one or two core system. So they buy the system. They factory deconfigure. Maybe they buy a four core or a six core system. They factory deconfigure some cores and that way they don't have to have an OS associated with those cores because in power systems you have to have an OS associated with every active core. So if you factory deconfigure, you don't have to have an OS. And that means you don't have to have Swama for an OS. If you have Power VM, you don't have to have Power VM. So there's some software savings. It's not really hardware savings, but there's software savings. And that's used actually, like I said, quite a bit in, um, in the smaller systems, uh, particularly IBM I. So let's talk about um, elastic COD here. Elastic COD is a way to use some of those dark cores and memory um, on your system for short periods of time, so in, in one-day increments, all right? And this is a prepaid, so you pay for this up front, and then you get to use it. And all of these require an HMC, so you need an HMC to do this. And you order these elastic COD processor or memory days through your seller, all right? And then you can order them in bulk. You're not ordering them against a particular system. If you have a bunch of systems, you order like a bulk order of these of, of whatever type you want, and then they're there for your use, all right? There's no contract. There used to be a contract that you have to sign and everything. No longer contract registration, all that kind of stuff. You used to have to report monthly all your usage. That's kind of gone the way they've set it up now too, so it's much easier to use now. And, and once you have these, you can actually provision the resources and get them on your system very short time. It's really easy to do. So this is available on the Power 8 and the Power 9 systems, okay? And you can kind of see the, the systems here. I've listed which ones it's available on. And you have to have certain, certain operating system support for this. Now, the list on this is quite long, so I didn't put the whole list in here. But this is kind of just the, the overview of what you can do. If you really um, are going to do this, you want to see the list, you can go to the link below here, and, and it will show you the, the whole list of things to do. But, but let's see how this really works for you, okay? First of all, you go to your, your seller and you order this elastic COD codes, all right? The seller goes into what we call the e-configuration and they actually order these codes for you. And once the codes are ordered, then uh, the ESS website, the Entitled System Support website, those codes show up in that site. So you as a customer then sign into ESS with your IBM, I, with your IBM ID, all right? And you make your way to an ESS to the generate the new code section of it. And then you'll, be, you'll see there the, the kinds of codes that you have. Then you, you pick what you want. So let's say you want 10 processor days. You pick what you want for a particular system and you assign it to a serial number in the ESS. And ESS will give you a code, all right, when you go through all of that. It will give you a code which you enter into your HMC. And once you do that, then you can assign processors, these extra dark cores, to an LPAR, right? And um, so, you, like I said, you prepay for these and then you can put them in there. Key thing with ECOD is you have to remember to deallocate those resources when you're done with them, okay? So if you get five, 10 processor days, for example, boss calls you up, says, hey, we need, we need five more cores on this system for the weekend because of whatever we're doing, and you go in there and you get the codes, you put them on that system, you take five cores, you put them on an LPAR, and then you forget about them. It's going to use up those five cores, all right, two days. You've used your 10 processor days, and then it's going to start to accrue a negative balance. And, and say you come in after the weekend and you forget about them for Monday, Tuesday, you go to the HMC, and the HMC is giving you codes that, hey, 
you are now accruing a negative balance. So the HMC will tell you that, that you're doing this. And so you go and you deallocate them, all right, and, and everything's good. But maybe you've gone five processor days over, so you have a negative balance. Next time you go in and you put, say, 10 processor days on there, it's going to use five of them to take up that negative balance. You have to remember to turn them off. So key thing here. Now on the bottom of this particular chart, I put in um, some of the costs. List prices, these costs are really just to give you an idea, all right? So I don't know what the discounts you might get, and, and prices can always change. But this is just an idea of what processor days cost. Obviously, an IBM, IBM I processor day costs more because the IBM I, IBM I operating system is more expensive. And then AIX Linux is a little bit cheaper, all right, and um, cheaper yet on the mid ranges, okay? So that's how um, Elastic COD works um, processor days. Now, um, the next type of COD is utility COD. And I'm going to call this utility classic because um, when we talk about PEP 2.0, that's really utility in the new, that's the new utility COD, okay? And we came out with utility COD. We had Power 6 and Power 7. It's discontinued on those, so you can't do this on Power 6 or Power 7 anymore. We, can't, we had it on Power 9. Actually, technically, we still have it on the Power 9. But when we get to PEP 2.0, that really replaces this on, the, on Power 9. So we're pushing people, don't use it on Power 9. You want to use PEP 2.0. And it will be discontinued on, on Power 9 in the near future. won't be offered on Power 10. So if you have Power 8, this is something that you may want to use. Now, you don't do it by the day. Utility COD is minute by minute. So you pay by the minute, and it's postpaid. You're not buying it ahead of time. You pay for it after you've used it. <clears throat> Again, an HMC is required. And this is automated. It, it's, it's, it's more, it uses it as it's, needed, as it's needed. And if it's not needed, you're not being charged. So it's a little bit different from ECOD that way. And again, it's short term. It's, it's only by the minute. So if you have a spike for a minute, that's all you're charged for is a minute. So this allows dark processors to fulfill the demands of a shared processor pool when that shared processor pool goes above its, its 100%, all right? So a minute is used when at least 10% of the utility processor is used for one minute. So as, as, you, as you go above your 100% on your pool and it starts using these, these dark cores to fulfill it, um, if 10% over one minute is used, it's going to count that minute and it'll keep counting whatever minutes you go above that for 10%, okay? So you go to the COD website, which, which is below here. There's a link. You go to that website, and from that website, you can enable, you can enable utility COD on your Power 8 system. You can disable it. You can report usage and stuff. And so we're going to look now on, on how this really works, OK? So you go to the utility website, <coughs> and you enable utility COD on a system, and you get a key. You use the HMC to enter the key, and then you can assign dark cores to a particular pool. All right, and and now you just you're using your system. Your system is going along. If it goes above and it uses these minutes, it's keeping track of minutes. Everything um, is reported and purchased in 100-minute increments. So this little um, chart down here at the bottom, if you have um, one to four dark cores, what we call inactive processors. All right, dark cores, non-active resource. If you have one to four, your reporting threshold is 500 minutes. So as you get close to 500 minutes by, I think it's 90% of 500 minutes usage, the HMC is going to tell you, hey, go report your usage. This is how much you report. So you go to that utility COD, and you report what the HMC told you. All right? The, the, the website's going to give you a key. You, re, you put that key back in the HMC, and it says, okay, you've reported good. We're just going to keep going along now. All right? Um, <clears throat> If you don't report um, anything within 30 days of reaching your limit, or if you don't report anything with, before reaching the reporting limit, in this case for, for the top one, 1,000 minutes usage, then it will disable um, COD and, and it won't use those dark cores anymore. All right. So um, if you don't pay your bill, um, you know, when, when you report those in the HMC, then it goes back to IBM. IBM generates a bill. Then you get sent for a bill for those minutes that you've used, and you pay your bill, and, and everything's cool. If you never pay your bill, then the COD website will stop giving you codes, and you won't be able to use um, utility COD anymore either. 
So on the right-hand side here, I've given an idea of the cost. So 100 minutes um, of utility COD uh, on an 850 is $1. So $1 for 100 minutes. I think that's pretty good, actually. Um, there's 1,440 minutes in a day, so that's $14.40 per day of, of a core, all right, for AIX or Linux. Um, you can see, again, on IBM I, it's uh, a little bit more expensive, it's always the case. <coughs> and on the, on the larger systems, then it's a little bit more. Okay. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the cost of doing all these things. The great thing about utility COD is you don't, re you don't have to remember, oh, I've got to take that off or else I'm going to accrue a negative balance or something. It's, it's postpaid, and it's only by the minute that you go above. So if you go above you know, once a week for some reason, you know, end of week processing, end of quarter, end of month, whatever it is for your business and your workload, then it's, it's only at that time, and you're just, you're just charged for the extra minutes that you use. Pretty easy stuff. All right. So since Utility COD came out, now we have a new one, and that's Processor Enterprise Pools 1.0. And this is a way to move resources from one system to another without being charged. Okay. So, so far what we've talked about is adding short-term usage to a system, but you always have to pay for it. And it's, it's, it's just on that one system. I mean, in the end, when you, pay, when, you, when you allocate them, you're only allocating them to one system. In this case, you can actually move resources from one system to another. So, and so Power Enterprise Pools brought up two new things. One is pools, putting your systems in a pool um, together, and two is mobile activations. So we have both static activations and mobile activations on PEP 1.0. And um, there's, there's a minimum of static activations, so static activations can't be moved. And mobile, you can move them from one system to another. All right. So there's certain pools um, that can be created from your systems. All right. So we're talking about Power 7, Power 8, and Power 9. You can only have two generations in a pool. So you can have Power 7 or Power 8. You can have Power 8 and Power 9. You can't have Power 7 and Power 9 in the same pool, okay? So this little box over here on the right shows what the pools, what systems can be in what pool, all right? So these systems can be in a pool together, and these systems can be in a pool together, and these types of systems can be in a pool together. A system cannot be in two pools at the same time, all right? So you can't have two different pools that have um, the same system in them. So, uh, and let's see. You can move your, your mobile activations. Once you get this set up and you have your pool set up, you don't need to talk to IBM anymore about moving anything around. There's no charge to move activations. You can move them um, all over the place. So in my little diagram over here on the side here, I've got so many cores on this system, so many cores on this, the other system. And you can move those, those activations from one system to the next. Um, it's very easy to do. It's non-disruptive. And um, it happens um, instantly. And so let's say you're, you're going to take this system down for um, maybe a firmware upgrade and move all your workload to the other system. You can do that by moving the resources over. You can move your workload over. You're not buying extra um, stuff to run on this system. Uh, you, know, you don't have to do prepaid days or postpaid minutes or anything over here. You're just moving these activations over. So really nice and, and easy to do. Um, there are some things that it's, it's integrated with, PowerHA, um, the LPM automation tool, which I think we talked about on, uh, on a bug webinar. Um, we, it's, it's integrated into that, so, so there's lots of cool stuff there. Power Enterprise Pool is very nice, but once again, you have to do these manual movements of your resources from one place to the next. And um, what we've done now is come out with a, a new and a better way of doing that, and that is called Power Enterprise Pools 2.0. Um, what I've also mentioned is also called Shared Utility Capacity or Private Cloud Shared Utility Capacity because um, when you start looking at all this cloud stuff, when you put these things together, these systems together in a pool, it looks like a cloud where you have this capacity on any of these systems. PEP 2.0 is the new and improved PEP 1.0. It's like uh, when you had a TV, you used to get up and have to change the channels on it, if you're old enough to remember that. Now you sit in your lounge chair, you grab your remote, you don't get up anymore. I don't think anybody gets up to change the channels anymore. Power Enterprise Pools is like that. Now you don't have to manually re move resources around. It sort of automatically does it. 
So there's not, there's not the concept of mobile cores and static cores anymore. It's a new concept, always something new. And this one we're going to kind of delve into a little bit deeper. So stick with me here. It's a little bit complicated to understand how this all works. We're going to kind of go through it. Um, now you have a base capacity on each system. So when you buy a system, you buy a base capacity, which is a number of cores or memory um, associated with that system that you've paid for. Now, when you put it in the pool, all the resources are active, okay? But you have a base capacity. When you go above the base capacity, you are mon it monitors your pool and it charges you by the minute that you go above, okay? And it actually uses um, what we call credits, all right? And, and we'll get to what credits are and what they cost and all that kind of stuff. So we have a cloud management console and it's monitoring all this. And you buy capacity activations, so processor activations or memory activations, and there's uh, um, a little bit um, of memory that we're going to talk about, and then you buy the OS activations. Now, the great thing about PEP 2.0 is it's not only for the 980s and the 950s, but it also goes to the scale out. So it started with the 980s, and then, and then later we added the 950s. And then if you recall, we came out with our scale out S924 and S922 G model systems. And when we did the G models, we added those um, to the Power Enterprise Pools 2.0 as well. So um, you can have three different pools. So let's just take a look here at some of the things. So PEP 2.0 on the scale out and the scale on the scale up and the scale out systems. All right. Cores, you can buy cores on this monitor cores on the scale up and the scale out systems. Memory, um, you buy base memory on the scale up systems. On the S922s and the S924s, you don't meter the memory. All your memory is active, so there's no base memory on the, on the scale out systems. Everything's active. So you buy AX and IBM entitlements on the 980. On the 950, um, as you know, if you're in IBM I world, doesn't support IBM I, so there's no um, IBM I on the 950 entitlements. On the scale out, there's both AIX and IBM I. Um, there's also, uh, as long as we're talking about this, um, base activations by OS. Um, we have IFL's integrated facility for Linux on our scale up system, so there are different activations for Linux only cores. And on these cores, um, you can buy base activations that are um, Linux only. On our scale out systems, we don't support IFL's, so any base activation is for. Um, any OS, okay? Um, you can buy capacity credits, so when we get to the credits, they are, can be purchased through the ESS portal, so you, you don't actually have to go through a seller to buy extra credits. Um, as we talked about capacity, elastic capacity on demand, it's only on the scale out, or the scale up systems, not supported on the scale out systems. The pools, um, this is a little bit different. In the scale-up system, you can have a, a pool of 980s. Okay, 980s can all be in a pool. 950s can be in a pool. You can't have 980s and 950s in the same pool. Okay, in the scale-out, you can have S922s and the 924s all in the same pool. So you can kind of intermix those. You'll note what's missing in here is the S914. S914s do not support um, Power Enterprise pools, uh, so you can't put S914s into a pool. Right, everything is managed through the cloud management console. Now we're going to see a demo of the cloud management console, um, and, and I'm really curious to see that because I haven't seen that actually in use yet. So we're going to see a, a demo of that later, and maybe that'll help kind of pull this together as well. And then <clears throat> I try before you buy. Actually, Lab Services has uh, we have a, a feature code where you can order some uh, a, an assessment by Lab Services on a scale up system. If you're doing scale out, no worries. We'll just get you a quote directly with Lab Services. We can do it. It's still happening. Um, and actually, Michael's going to talk to us a little yeah. bit about this tool. Joe, can I just jump in one second? Yeah, sure. The, yeah, the quote directly to Lab Services, that's not entirely correct. So the, the key thing to point out about this particular feature code, EP2X, is it, it's an assessment that includes trial capacity. So the idea is that in order to try before you buy, we, we will allow you to purchase a system with minimum activations, 
So one core of uh, uh, processor core and 256 gigabytes of memory. And then what we're going to do is for for 60 days, we'll we'll take the the systems and use trial activations to activate everything. And so then then you'll run normally, and we'll es essentially have a simulation of what it would be like if it were metered by the CMC. And then we'll produce a study to say this is what it would look like if you had uh, metered capacity, and this is what we think you should buy. And at that point. With the with the scale up systems, you have a choice. You can say, I, I'm going to just go with the traditional all static, or you could go uh, with PEP 1.0, PEP 2.0. You could do you know any number of things. But the point is, for that 60 days, we'll give you that trial. I'm not quite sure how we would do the trial part with scale out. I know we could do the assessment um, based on um, historical workloads that we can we can do, and I'll talk about that later. So I just want to point out that I'm not sure that we could. Give the try before you buy uh, option to customers, uh, but we can okay. do the assessment. So I'm not sure where that came from, but um, I'm not aware of any try before you buy for the scale out. Okay, so not not really a try before you buy, but we can do an assessment, which you're going to talk about in that other tool that, that you can correct, talk, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I want to show you a little bit just to, to see if we can clear this up on how this really works. A, a little bit of an example. And so this is an example of, in this case, three 980s. So each system has 128 cores installed. And on system A, they buy 32 base cores. And on system B, they buy 64 and system C, 96. So really the thing to look at is here's your pool, all right? There's 384 cores, what these three systems make up and 192 base cores purchased. Now when you put this in the pool, all the cores are active. So all these, all these above the base, these, everything's active on the system. And we're only talking about CPU here, but it, this applies to memory as well. Now if we look at the system running, you can see in system A, we have a workload that's running above its base. So it's using all these cores plus some, some of these cores above the base. And that's fine. Workload runs fine. All these cores are active. No problem with that. System B is running a little bit lower than its base, and System C is way up here. But you can see what's the key is to look at the pool. In the pool, all the, if you count all the cores that are being used against all the base cores, it's not using any more than the base cores, so there's no metered minutes used. There's no charges, no extra charges at all. Now we take the same systems, and a little bit later, System B is running a little bit higher. Okay, so you got system A still running high, B is a little bit higher, C is still running high, and so you're coming along and all of a sudden you go on above your base. Now, every time that you're running above your base, everything runs fine, no problems, but these minutes are being metered, so you're going to pay a little extra. You're using your capacity credits to pay for this time that you go above your base. Now, just to take a little bit different look at this, um, here's the system A. And this is the workload for system A, <clears throat> all right? So if you, if you had this on a system and it's using, you know, maybe 35 cores in its peak, you're probably going to have, you know, 37, 39, 40 cores that you're going to actually have allocated on this system A to take care of this workload. Here's system B. So here's another system that you have and its workload, and it's kind of similar. You might have 35 or so cores on this system that are active cores to take care of this workload. But if you look at these systems together, and that's what this purple line here represents, this is the peak for those two systems. So if you had those systems separately, not pooled together, you'd be, buy you'd be buying about 78 cores or so total for those two systems. But if you have them in a power enterprise pool, you can get by with 57 cores, and it will never go over your base you know, with, this, with this particular workload. So you buy fewer cores, and you're still taking care of everything. But if you look at this, these peaks are pretty short here. And so you could get by with 47 cores, just an example, get by with something like 47 cores, and these, the, these other 10 cores are just sitting there doing nothing for maybe 90% of the time or something, right? So why buy a full core to sit there idle for 90% of the time when you can get the same performance and just pay for the short amount of time that it goes over? All right, so that's, that's how you want to look at when you, when you purchase a system, how to size the system for, um, for yourself, right? So I keep talking about these capacity credits that it's used. 
And I want to, I want to give you a little information about the credits and then how they're used, and then we'll look at the costs and, and how you tie this together. So a capacity credit costs $240. Now you can buy them in groups of 10, 100, 1,000. Um, you can buy them through, um, through your sale, seller. You can buy them through the, the ESS site. Okay, so it's $240 all. So. And again, cost subject to change, this is what they are um, if you go to look today. What does a capacity credit give you? On an E980, you can buy 20,000 minutes with a capacity credit. Okay, so 20,000 minutes, 1440 minutes a day is about not quite 14 days. All right, so that $240 buys you 14 days on an E980 of any OS activation for a core. On a 950, you get 60,000 and you get 130,000 or about 90 days on the scale out systems. All right? If you, if you do Linux only cores, which I said are available on our scale up systems, then it's, it's 40 and, and 90,000, all right? And we don't, we don't offer that on the scale out. Okay, so besides that, you need an OS associated with every core. So um, a credit, so we're still using credits, it buys you 30,000 minutes <coughs> on the 980, 50,000 on the 950, 50,000 on the scale out. And IBMI, again, is another cost, only 1,500 minutes. And then, of course, we don't offer IBMI in the 950, 2,000 on the scale out systems. And then memory is a different charge, 1.5 million minutes um, per gigabyte on the 980 and um, 5 million on this. And, and as I said, we don't offer memory base activations on the scale out systems. So a lot of numbers here, credits, costs, and stuff. Let's try to tie this together with an example. So this is a 980, 16 cores, and 512 gigabytes of memory for 30 days. All right. So let's just say you have your 980 sitting there, and you've you've put 16 cores. You've gone above your base limit to the total of 16 cores 100% of the time for 30 days. And, and let's look at how these charges add up. Whoops. There we go. So 16 cores, number of processor minutes. You take 16 times 30 times the 1440. That's the number of processor minutes you use. You divide it. The 980, you get 20,000 minutes per credit. So you've used 334.56 credits, $240 a credit, a little over $8,000. Plus, for that time, you have to put an OS onto that core as well. So 16 cores, same time, minutes, um, 30 days, all the minutes per day. You get 30,000 divided by the 30,000 that you get from AIX entitlement and 23 credits used, $5,000. And then the 512 gigabytes is the same way except for it's 512 times 30 times 1440. Gives you this 22 million and then minus what you get um, for memory activation and you're paying, you know, three thousand dollars, thirty-five hundred dollars for your memory. So all told up, if you did sixteen cores on your 980, 100 percent of the time for 30 days, seventeen thousand dollars, three hundred sixty-three. Okay. Now I wouldn't say this is really a very accurate example because you're probably not doing sixteen cores 30 days unless you've meant to do that because you want to do um, a more of um, not a capital expense, but an operational expense. So you buy few cores, and you and you just plan on spending money every month um, to pay for it. Okay, by using credits. Probably a more a, a better way of looking at this is here's here's the example we just ran through, seventeen thousand dollars. But if you did that same example, and you're running in your workload, and you really your workload's only eight hours a day, where it's really busy. So instead of instead of the whole day, you only have eight hours a day. Your cost is you know, 57, almost $5,800, okay? If you're eight hours a day, but you're not going above your base all the time, you're only 50% of the time going above your base, then you have a different charge, okay? And let's just compare these charges with Elastic COD, where you actually buy a whole processor day, all right? If you bought six, 16 cores for 30 days, all right, the 480 processor days at $11 a day, that's, $5,200, and then you pay the 512 gigabytes of memory, that's $7,200 total, okay? So you can see it's less than if you did it by PEP 2.0, right? So if you're really going to do it, um, 
buy it that way. It's probably cheaper to do elastic COD, but it's more expensive than if you're just going above your base and, and you plan, um, plan it correctly so that you, you're running close to your base and you only go above uh, on those spikes, okay? When to use base processors versus not to use base processors. That's a key thing here. And so let's just look at some list price comparisons um, just to give you an idea. And again, these are list prices. Um, these prices can change. And, and I'm only doing this to give you an idea, all right? So um, if you bought an S922 with 20 cores, a terabyte of memory, AIX standard edition, you get a certain cost, 98000 roughly, okay? If you did that same system, all right, with 20 cores, um, a terabyte of memory, and did AX Cloud Edition, which you want to do because you, you need that CMC, then um, if you did 10 base cores, half of it, you're a little bit over, all right? If you did eight base cores, you're a little bit under. So you can kind of see about half the cores. If you're going to do half the cores or less, then um, PEP 2.0 is a good a good thing maybe. So a 924, same thing. You can actually get by a little bit more and still have it be a good thing. The 950, um, at 13, um, you kind of are still under it. So you can kind of go over the half and still be a good deal. And then again, at the 980s, 24, um, you're still under it. So um, as, as you get higher systems, you can buy more cores and still have it pay off. Again, this just gives you a rough idea, okay? List price, no discounts in here. Um, these are going to fluctuate. But if you're looking at a pool where you have, say, 100 cores in your pool, but you think you need 80 base, 80 cores base or 90 cores base, probably um, doesn't pay to do that because, you know, you could, you could buy a base core cost more than just a regular activation. You could activate all the cores in that system, and, and you wouldn't be able to share amongst the systems, all right? But if you had all the cores active, you don't need to and it might be cheaper. So a lot of numbers here, a lot of examples, really hard to tell. You know, you're saying, Joe, you know, I've got so many systems. I have to put workloads on top of each other. I have to figure out where peaks are. I have to do these costs. My little brain hurts. How do I figure this out? And that's why we have Michael. Michael's going to tell us about a tool from Lab Services um, that will help us to do this. Now, no, Michael um, is from Lab Services. We've talked about Lab Services tools before. Um, they're not just free. Um, Michael isn't free like the Joe Armstrongs of the world and, and uh, CTSs where you can use and abuse us all you want. Lab services comes, there's usually a cost. That said, we're very creative with taking care of those costs. And um, so if you're going to do this, don't really worry about the cost. We'll deal with that. Um, look at this tool because this will help you. Um, and with that, um, Michael, do you want me to just go through these charts for you then? or? How do you want yeah, to do this? if you wouldn't mind, yeah, so we don't have to switch over. I'll just say next slide. So, so hi, so thank you. Uh, as Joe said, I work in, in lab services. Um, some of you may know me. I um, have worked on our capacity planning tool over the years, and um, this new tool is actually an extension of the capacity planning tool. It's part of the capacity planning tool suite, and we call it CPT MCM or metered capacity modeling. So the idea is to create a model or a simulation of your existing workloads and what would they look like in a PEP 2.0 environment. So this will help us not only size, you know, we have tools to size the physical systems, but the question becomes, well, how do we size for base capacity? And where is the optimal amount of base based on our workload history and the statistical frequency of those workload peaks? So if you have, if you have peaks that are infrequent, um, it is typically better to pay for them with the utility minutes. So as an example, the, um, the price, it, it, as, as Joe had shown you, the $240 uh, capacity credit will get you uh, a rate of about $0.02 cents per minute for AIX. So that is the, that's the price you would pay if you had metered um, AIX above the base. Now, if you were to purchase a, a core, ahead of time. So you buy an activation, you pay hardware maintenance on that activation over, let's say, three years. You buy a, a, a AIX one-time charge for a license, and then you pay software maintenance over three years. 
it would cost about a penny a minute to run. So for every every core that that you have licensed over three years, it will cost about a penny a minute. So obviously there's a premium to going to the uh, metered uh, rate. However, if you use that metered rate less than half the time, I'll just, it, it works out kind of conveniently that way to explain it. So if you use it less than half the time at a certain um, point, it makes more sense to pay as you go. And so you can actually save quite a bit of money if you study your workloads and, and see that they're very peaky and, and I'll show you how we can do that. Next slide, please. So um, this is part of our normal discussion. I'm not gonna uh, talk about the uh, private cloud solution with shared utility capacity as, as Joe has got into that. And I'm not gonna get into too much about the CPT suite, but I do wanna talk about how we do collect data so you can understand what it would take if you were interested in this study, what you would need to give us. Next slide, please. So again, just, just as a reminder, this, this will be something that we can use on any of our systems to scale out or scale up uh, that support the solution. So um, we've done, we've done um, 40 to 50 of these studies so far, and I'd say about um, 10 to 15 percent of them have been on scale out uh, boxes. So uh, just as a, a, a observation I have, the, the scale out, the scale out uh, PEP 2.0 uh, is not as good a value as it is for on the scale up systems. Part of that is because we have to price the the uh, S922 and 924 as one as one class of systems, even though there's two of them. And the other thing is um, compared to the the price of the, um, the the price of the activations, the there's uh, not a not a big difference. Uh, it's it's a little bit better activation wise to just pay for pay for a fully activated 922 924 however where it does come into play is if you have um, the software licenses of course don't have to be uh, the full the full system so this is where we can look and see and especially with IBM I on the scale out you can see a tremendous savings um, if you if you have these uh, different workload peaks so I just want to point out that this solution and this um, and this uh, study that we can do can be on either scale out or scale up. Um, next slide. All right. So what what we you've seen this before. This what this purple line and this green line show you the 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 savings you get with pooling, right? So that that first order of savings that you get with PEP 2.0 is not unlike what you get with PEP 1.0. It's almost as if we could consolidate your workloads onto one. 800 core system or 1200 core system, right? You take all of your servers and you stack them up and you can take advantage of the fact that, that uh, um, you know, everything can, can add up uh, these residual cores in, into, into one total core per minute. So that first green arrow gets us to a point where we have th this pool consolidation um, savings. And you can almost do that PEP 1.0, PEP 1.0, could almost get that green line. Um, there's a couple problems. One is, you know, you can't move fractional cores between systems. So uh, PEP 1.0 can't be perfectly aligned to that peak. So you may have to, to move that line up a little bit for PEP 1.0. And the other thing is, obviously, you have to, to make sure that you move resources where they're needed when they're needed. So that PEP, PEP 1.0 relies on automation like PowerHA, Roja, or or um, uh, Power VC uh, doing DRO or what what have you. So um, the the beauty of PEP 2.0 is that green line is exactly if that if your workloads continue like that, you will never need more than what that green line is to the actual fraction of a core. So that uh, that's that's how that'll work. So a lot of times this is where the 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 messaging stops and we say, hey, look at this great consolidation you get, but um, what we can do with with lab services and, and um, Joe, if you could just advance just slowly uh, one more, two more, I think. Yeah, one more. It should be. Is it redrawing? Ah, there we go. Okay. So I, I think Joe alluded to this that there's this there's this other line that we can we can find this optimal base, 
which is where we can look at the statistical frequency of the workload peaks and say above this line, it is more economical to pay by the minute that that 2 cents a minute is actually more economical than paying 1 cents a minute for something you're underutilizing. And, and, you know, in some case, drastically underutilizing, we, we can see. So that's what our study can can uncover. What we do is we take your historical workloads. We, we model them as power 9, so we can take anything going back, you know, as far as we can, as long as we can get 1 minute samples. We can make it look like PEP 2.0. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, one more slide, please. So, as I said, this CPT MCM is part of our, our CPT tool suite and we, you know, we've always had this capacity planning tool to do right sizing. Then we had CPT SCON to help us look at server consolidation. Um, and now we have CPT MCM. We still will use CPT SCON uh, for PEP 2.0 environments because you still need to size the partitions. You still need to figure out. Uh, what their uh, EC and VP is, the CPT MCM is really looking at sizing your base capacity. Your, it, it, it's a study of your per core charges, right? So, the, the per core you have your your licensing, your OS licensing, your SWAMA, your hardware um, activation and hardware maintenance costs that are tied to per core. That's where we want to we want to kind of uh, zero in on. So next slide. Okay, so what we can do with this CPT MCM is we can look at pools 2.0 before you make the investment. So this is a it's it's essentially a sizing tool, but it's it can also help you see the value of PEP 2.0. And in, in some cases we we can show over a million dollars, over a million euros worth of savings for larger environments. Um, and we have seen that because um, you can you can really gear gear the amount to what your your steady state is and the peaks pay as you go. Um, we take as I said historical data, scale it by our perf, um, and and use that as our as our uh, per minute uh, model. So we need to capture data in in one minute samples because that's the same way that the CMC is going to measure it. So. If we could take one minute uh, samples and see the average physical consumption over one minute, then we can use that in this uh, study. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so how do we get the data? We need this LPAR util data that, that you may already have. If you have LPAR to RRD, you'll have 60 days worth of one minute samples we can take right away and, and boom, we can do a study with that right away. If we can't go back in time, which is unfortunate, we can still give you a collection script, a very simple collection script that, that'll get the data that we need. And then we can take a look at it after a day, a week, a month, what, whatever. The goal is really to try to come up with a, a, a business cycle, to try to look at what, um, what would, if we took this uh, month of data and repeated it 12 times a year for three years, would that be uh, representative of your business? And sometimes in order to do that, we need to make sure we capture end of month or end of quarter, things like that. So it's important that we, that we build the best model that we can. But even before we get the, the, the finished product, we can still see where the workloads can be uh, peaky or not and, and definitely get a, a good sense of where the savings is gonna be. Uh, we obviously need to know the target architecture each of these different uh, keck types are going to have different uh, uh, cores per socket, and as you know, the the frequency uh, for the different cores per socket uh, are going to be different due to uh, the fact that we can run fewer cores uh, hot uh, faster at the same temperature. So uh, I need to know what that is so we can get the right R per scaling. We also need to know the version of AIX that you're using because obviously, if we tell you it's two cents a minute for AIX, that's two cents a minute. For an AIX uh, that's fully licensed in SWAMA, SWAMA at whatever version you had. So if, if you had um, Enterprise Edition or Cloud Edition, that's what that we're extending that to the each each additional metered core. And then we need to know how many years you're going to own or lease the system. So the model is going to be based on that. We then we collect the data and we find the most cost effective solution. Next slide. 
So the one thing to point out about this data collection is it's very unobtrusive. It's not going to be um, if you're familiar with how LPAR RD works or how you know LPAR util works. It's it's um, OS agnostic. It is agentless, so you don't have to install any agents. What we're doing is we're we're taking advantage of the fact that the HMC is going to pull the hypervisors to get these counters. These counters that tell you how many. Um, how many cycles were devoted to, to dispatching threads and executing workloads. And from that, we can do the math and figure out what the physical consumption is. So that's great. Now, the data on the HMC is volatile. So the, the data, the HMC is not a data warehouse, so it, it's going to throw things out rather quickly, which is why LPAR to RRD came to be. It's a, a way of offloading that very useful data to some persistent database. So we need, we need to offload the that in a similar fashion, if we give you a collection script, we're going to want to, you know, run it nightly and pull a day's worth of data every night so that we don't lose that from the HMC. Next slide. Okay, so all we need to make sure is that you have the LPARC util collection turned on and you do that with the chlpar util command. We can show you how to do that. Um, we want to make sure your HMCs are using uh, network time protocol. Similar to the, the same um, requirement that the CMC is going to have, we want to just make sure that everything's lined up properly. So make sure you have the right time because we're going to get data from different HMCs for this study and we're going to have to shift some of the data um, based on time zones. And so we just want to make sure that we line everything up uh, as perfectly as possible. Uh, we can run it once a night. There's an example of cron tab. And then the script is really as simple as this little one liner here. So we, you know, cycle through the HMCs, go to each HMC, cycle through the frames for each frame. Get, get LSL par util for 25 hours, 20, 25, just to be safe. So we don't lose anything and um, get 25 hours worth of data at uh, the LPAR level. And we grab all these different cycle values. And from that we can, and you can see the example CSV file. From that, we can do everything we need to to do our uh, do the math and figure out what it's going to look like. Next slide. So then the next steps we normally would say, give us the data after a day or two. We're going to take that data and we're going to um, give you an initial look at it and make sure there's no no um, missing uh, uh, LPARs, missing frames, and everything that's in scope is appearing. And then we'll say, okay, keep it running uh, every night. And then about one week, we can get a you know, first real look at it, like a weekly cycle. And then we can show you what that looks like. And then um, again, we do the same thing again at, at one month or however long we need um, in order to, in order to get the best view of this. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention is we can manipulate the model if we need to. If let's say um, we start collecting this week and you say, um, you know, this week we have end of quarter and uh, next week is a typical week. We can take those two weeks, that's a, a, a end of quarter week and a typical week, and I could take the typical week and say, let's run that, play that back 12 times for every one time we do a peak week, and that's a quarter. You know, a quarter looks like that, and then we can use that as our business cycle. Okay, that's, that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I'll take a look um, and then Stephanie's going to show you the CMC, but um, we've done this for a number of clients. And as Joe said, uh, if you're interested, we will do this for you. We will find a way um, to, to find funding for it because we want to promote this, uh, this solution and we want to show people the value of it. So please reach out to me if you, if you're interested or, or your sales uh, team, and we'll have, be happy to do it for you. All right. Thank you, Michael. All right, so there's been a lot of things I, where I mentioned the cloud management console uh, that it it's used to monitor your pool, and you know I, I didn't I didn't say I, I told you what was in the pool in the 980s and your 950s in a pool and then scale out in a different pool. The systems don't have to be in the same data center; they can be anywhere in the country. We don't allow pools to span across country bound lines. There's some international rules and stuff, so. So your pool has to be in the same country, but they don't have to be in the same data center. So you can have your pool spread all over the country if you want. And the CMC, um, despite the, uh, the name, Cloud Management Council, it isn't for managing your things or in some public cloud. We, we 
kind of think of this as a private cloud. So the CMC runs in the cloud, but it's going to monitor this. And um, it's used to do all kinds of things. In fact, let's see, let's go to the next one. This, I, I'm not going to go through this because I think Stephanie's going to talk more about it as, as she goes through her um, little spiel. So um, I think what I'm going to do here is um, stop sharing, and I'm going to give things to Stephanie to start to use. And um, I just have to get back to Stephanie making you the presenter. Here we go. All right. So Stephanie, while she's gearing up her presentation, I'll just do a yeah. little introduction of her. So Stephanie's a software engineer um, in, on the HMC and the CMC team. So she's been in development uh, as a technical lead for a long time on all the power capacity on-demand offerings, um, including uh, PEP 2.0. So Stephanie's the lead on the Cloud Management Council, and um, she's got a lot of experience on this. In fact, she knows more about all these things than, than most people. And she is going to demo the Cloud Management Council for us. So with that, Stephanie, um, why don't you Thanks, take Joe. over? Um, but I don't have the sharing capability yet. Um, so. yeah, oh, there okay. we go. Let's, now got I've it got now? it. Got it now. Got it now. Okay. Yep. Okay, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, let me bring up the CMC. So CMC actually runs in the IBM Cloud, and you access it via a web interface. Um, I'm using Google Chrome at the moment. Um, but anyway, um, you, each customer will have their own instance, and there's several locations that we offer CMC. Uh, there's a, you can have a portal in Dallas, Frankfurt, London, or Sydney. We continue to add locations as time goes on, and what you want to do is you want to choose the location that is obviously closest to your data center, hopefully in the same country as your data center. That's, that's what we recommend. You want to have somewhat, some proximity to uh, where your CMC is running. Um, anyway, you just log in with an IBM ID. So let me do that. And it comes up and there's actually multiple apps inside CMC. I'm not going to cover any of them, but the Enterprise Pools 2.0 app, but just want to make, make you aware that there are other functionalities there. We have a capacity monitoring app, which does what you would kind of think it does, which is it you can use it to monitor the performance of your the processor performance, CPU performance of your partitions and systems, uh, memory allocation, network traffic performance, storage performance. So it kind of provides um, performance monitoring for all of your systems and partitions that you have. Um, there's also an inventory app, which shows you all the, all the systems and partitions across your data centers uh, that are all connected to uh, CMC. And there's a logging app that kind of gives you insights into things like partition mobility if you use that. Um, it, it can keep track of like the time it takes to do partition mobility operations, um, partition lifecycle operations, which are, uh, you know, activate and shut down, create, and delete, things like that. And there is also a patch planning app, which helps you organize all the updates and upgrades required for your, your server firmware, your HMCs, your AIX partitions, your IBMI partitions, um, things like that. So there are these other capabilities in CMC. Um, besides the Enterprise Pools 2.0 app. I also want to mention um, the way it works is you connect your HMCs. There's a daemon on the HMC called Cloud Connector that you start up. You connect your HMCs to CMC, and what that daemon does, that Cloud Connector daemon, is it actually collects the utilization and inventory data off your systems. It uses that for utilization. It uses the same data that Michael was talking about, the LPAR util data or the PCM, performance and capacity monitoring data. It's all the same data that's collected from PHYPE. Um, it basically collects that data and it pushes it up to CMC. Um, there's a one way, uh, there's one way pushing from HMC to CMC. CMC does not push data back down into your environment. Um, you don't need a direct connection. We do support proxy connections, so you can go through a proxy server. Um, but that's how basically it works. So I'm going to start the Enterprise Pools 2.0 app and show you what that looks like. Um, so this is the app, and in my app, I actually have three different pools. Um, I'm only going to look at this first pool, this Garage for System demo pool um, in this demo. But you can have, if you have multiple pools, because as you know, um, you can't mix system types in the same pool. So you may have more than one pool if you have more than one system type. Um, but if, if you have multiple pools, you can see them in the same CMC portal. Um, so here, 
um, the first screen that comes up is what we call the inventory screen and it basically shows you the inventory of your pool so this top area um, shows you all the information about your pool so first we show you your cores uh, we show you the total installed and how much of that total is currently being used by the servers in your pool and then we show you all the different resource types that we support in enterprise pools so we have the NEOS cores and the Linux VOS cores. Again, the Linux VOS cores are the ones that can only run Linux and VOS. They're like the IFL cores, if you're familiar with those that we support today for power. Um, anyway, these are the hardware cores, the NEOS and the Linux, VOS, Linux and VOS. It shows you the total amount of base, uh, which you've permanently purchased for your pool of each of those. And then it shows you what's currently in use. So you can see for NEOS, for example, I've purchased six base. For my pool and across my pool there's currently only 3.03 .03 in use um, therefore i have no metered uh, capacity uh, charges for the neos uh, base same is true for linux i'm underneath right now i'm underneath the uh, what i've purchased for the pool so there's no metered charges going on there and then the only other type of resource i purchased for my pool is i did purchase six um, aix software licenses and again uh, we're below um, our base there across the pool so there's no metered charges there either um, I could purchase IBM I um, or SLES. We do support SLES metering as well. Um, I did not purchase any in the pool. And in fact, I have no IBM I or, or SLES LPARs in this pool. Um, I only have Red Hat, AIX, and BOS. Um, Red Hat right now, uh, we don't have software charging for. Um, that is something that we have announced a statement of direction uh, to provide software charging for uh, RHEL in the future, but not currently supported. Um, you can, I mean, you can run rel partitions. We just don't do the software license metering for rel today. We only do the hardware uh, core metering um, because each partition does have a hardware uh, component and a software component. So a core, um, a, for, for example, an AIX partition using one core, uh, we will count that as one core of NEOS and one core of AIX software. So there are no software charges for VOS or for any type of Linux except for SLES. Um, over here, we show you your memory, and here um, you can see same kind of thing. Uh, we have the total installed and how much is currently in use of that installed. Um, we also show you how much base you have for your pool and what's currently being used. So right now you're right at your base, so there's no metered charges for memory going on at the current time either. I do want to mention that for uh, cores, we charge you by actual utilization of your, uh, your partitions, what they actually utilize from a core perspective, um, and it's done by the minute and it's the average over that minute minute not the peak um, again it's the same data you see with lpar2 rrd or pcm on the hmc um, so that same data is used here uh, for memory we actually charge you by allocation so if you have assigned memory to a partition that's what you get charged for we don't do it by actual usage because we have no way of really tracking and monitoring that usage so it's by assignment but only if your partitions are running if your partitions are shut down uh, there are no memory charges for those or memory uh i'll say charges but obviously it's only charges if you're above your base but there are no memory charges for partitions that are shut down only for partitions that are active or running Okay, so down here we show you um, all the servers in your pool. In this case, we have two. Um, and then if you click the little button, you can see all the partitions in your pool um, on each server. So again, this shows you um, just the inventory, uh, the snapshot in time um, where you can uh, see the core and memory usage um, for all of your partitions and all of your servers um, at this current time. So one thing I want to mention briefly, um, I don't know if uh, some of you are using PEP 1.0. I suspect some of you are. It's been a pretty popular offering. Um, unlike PEP 1.0, when you want to make any changes to your pool configuration, when you want to create your pool or add systems or add resource or anything like that, you have to get an XML file from IBM in order to do that. And then you have to bring that XML file to your HMC and actually apply that um, to your pool, right, to make those configuration change, changes go into effect. For PEP 2.0, you don't have to deal with any of that. There's no XML files, no COD codes that you have to deal with. We do use COD codes, but you don't ever have to deal with them. Uh, what we do is we interface uh, directly to ESS, Entitled System Support. Um, that's where we get the COD codes that we need from for your servers, and we do that all automatically for you. So um, when you come into EP 2.0, if you want to create a pool, you just click the create a pool button and that's assuming that you've already gone to ESS to start your pool. You have to go to ESS first to get your pool ID and assign credits to your pool. 
Um, so once you've done that, you just come into CMC and say create pool and you give it your pool ID that you that you got from ESS and it shows you a list of all of your eligible servers that are connected to CMC and you just pick from that list what servers you want to put in your pool and then you basically click finish and you're off to the races. So um, it's all automatic, unlike um, all our other types of COD today. Like I said, there are COD codes, but you don't ever have to deal with them. It's all done automatically under the covers. So all the pool operations are available on this panel as well. You can add systems, you can over here, uh, you can move a system or remove a system. Um, this shows you this little menu for each server shows you uh, the base capacity for that particular server that is contributing to the pool. Um, it also shows you the state of your COD code for the server, which says it's authorized. Um, the codes that are pushed down to the servers are good for 90 days. Um, about 10 days prior to that code expiration, CMC will reach out to ESS and get a new code for you and send that down to your server. Um, so that's, um, it keeps the COD codes up to date. Um, as long as you, of course, keep your uh, pools up to date, as long as you continue to um, have capacity credits in your pool, and as long as you continue to pay for those credits uh, when you purchase them. So that's how that all works. It's all automatic. So it's pretty nice. Um, I'm going to move on now to the next page and go to core usage. This is um, the page that's a lot more interesting because here is where it basically gives you your historical, your current and your historical views of everything going on in your pool. So this graph that you see is a pool level graph um, and there's different data types we show here. Right now I'm showing you the total usage across your pool um, of your, and this is core, so it's of your cores. Um, there's a memory page too, which we'll look at, which is very, very similar to this core page. So what this is, um, so right now there's different zoom levels. Okay, we're at the hour level. So when you launch this page by default, it basically, uh, it basically selects the current day um, at the hour level. Okay, so um, you can see the usage for your pool um, at the hour level across here. We show about three days altogether. Um, if you want to uh, see usage, basically there's different options. You can drill down. We do charge you by the minute. So you may want to go all the way down to the minute, which you can. So here, let's say, let's say you want to look at this hour because your usage is pretty high and you want to go down to the minute level, just see what it looks like at that level. And you can see across that minute, across that hour, it, the usage is actually fairly consistent. It did drop a little bit and drop a little bit. If you're interested in finding out what partitions are causing this usage, so let's say you want to see here what's going on, you can select this minute if you want. You can do update table data and you can scroll down here and you can see what all the partitions in your pool are doing at this particular minute that you selected. So you can see here, this is the minute I selected. So it's 7.46 this morning to 7.47. Um, here's a list of all my partitions. This is sorted um, by their, their average core usage. Average core usage is the usage of those partitions over the selected time frame. So in this case, it's the usage of these partitions at this particular minute. Um, it's, support, it's sorted by highest usage first. So you can see this uh, partition on top had the most usage during that minute. And you can scroll down and look at every uh, partition in your pool and what they're doing for that minute. So you can actually um, drill down and you can select any time frame you want. Let's say you didn't want to just look at this one minute. Let's say you wanted to look at, you know, these minutes here, right? You could do that. You can select, whoops, my, my uh, laptop has an issue with selecting. Sorry, it's not, there we go. Um, you can select whatever uh, time range you want to see. Uh, you click update table data and you can um, scroll down and see what your partitions are doing over that time range. So um, it's very, so you can also, if you want to, so let's say you can go out, you can zoom out if you want and go to the day level. Um, you can zoom out even further and go, let's all the way out to the month level if you want, right? So you can look at your pool. At your pool. This pool has been in uh, commission since about the beginning of March. So you don't have any data for previous months, but you can um, zoom out, zoom in. Uh, you can select any interval you want. You can uh, drill down into the usage by partition. We also uh, show you by system. Uh, there's a system page where we can show you that same usage for that same selected interval. Um, the other thing you can do, I'm gonna go back to the hour um, table first or graph first. Um, the other thing you can do is you can flip over and say, I only wanna see my metered usage, right? This graph type, like I said, is, is, core, is total usage. Um, you only wanna see your metered usage, which you can do by flipping the graph type to metered usage. And so here you can see, um, you don't have much metered usage. You have a lot going on in one particular minute, but across, you know, this is showing you about three days. 
here at the hour level. You can see there's only a few hours of each day where you actually have some meter usage going on. So again, if you want to drill down, um, you can do that. So let's say here we're going to select, we're at the hour level, we're going to select this hour and you can see by resource type, um, the purple, this light purple is the NEOS core usage. You have 96 total NEOS core minutes for this hour. Um, you have this darker purple is your Linux VOS core usage. You have 101 total core minutes for that hour. And this lighter blue is your AIX software usage. You have 96 total AIX software minutes for this hour. Okay, so that's how it works. Um, and again, if you want to drill down and see what the partitions were doing, why are they running so high um, during this time? Because we have metered usage, so you can come down here and let me switch back to the partitions table. Um, this, by the way, that just popped up is one of the uh, notifications that we have. It's an in-app notification. Um, this one was a threshold that someone set up for partition core usage. Actually, it was in this pool over here. But we do have in-app notifications, um, and I'll get to those in a minute, but that's what that was that you saw that just happened to pop up on the screen over there. Um, anyway, so back to, um, I selected this uh, hour of metered usage, and I can uh, scroll down now and see what all my partitions were doing. So you can see if you compare like to the current core usage, this guy is running about the same, but like this guy was running quite a bit higher uh, during the, the time that we had metered usage. Um, same with this, it's, it's running, this guy was running about 12% um, higher uh, during that time of metered usage than it's running right now, for example. Right, so you can um, drill down and, and try to understand uh, what's causing your usage. Um, let's see, so uh, another thing you can do is if you're only interested in seeing like your AIX usage, you can do that by selecting filters. Um, let me go back to total usage. So here you can see just your AIX usage we show. Um, you had a total of 433 uh, AIX usage for this particular hour that's selected. Um, you can see your other usage too as well, but this is highlighting just your AIX usage. Um, so we have a calendar at the top, which is sort of quick selectors. If you wanted to see, for example, you want to see yesterday's usage, you could say, just show me yesterday's, right? And what it does is it redraws this graph um, at the hour level with yesterday selected. So um, if you wanted to see what your partitions were doing yesterday, right, you could do that by scrolling down and seeing what your partitions were doing yesterday. Um, so I think I'm going to move on to some memory usage real quick. It's very, very similar to core usage, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, you can see it, it's laid out in exactly the same way, different colors. We tend to use the oranges and yellows to uh, represent memory, blues and greens for processors. But just like for uh, cores, this is your pool, your total pool graph. It has all the different zoom levels. We're at the hour level uh, by default. It has, you can see metered usage and total usage um, here as well. Um, it's broken up again by um, OS type, right? And so you can see, and we have a table down here which shows you the memory usage um, of all your LPARs. And again, the average memory usage column is the one that shows you for the selected time range. Memory usage tends to be pretty consistent. There are some changes going on here um, across the pool, but it's, it's fairly consistent. Um, and you can see, if you want to see the memory usage, you can drill down just like you can for cores. So I'm going to flip over now and talk about um, some other um, things that we do. So budgeting, uh, we do allow you to set a metered credit budget per month. Um, so you can come in and set whatever you want. Um, you can run unlimited like this pool is doing, or you can actually choose an amount. Um, we can switch to limited and choose an amount. Let's say, uh, actually, I don't really, I, like, let's say I want to do 80, right? You can choose an amount and set it to 80. Um, what happens is, um, and it's for the month, right? So it, you can notice that none of my other months change. So I still have unlimited set for my future months. But for this month, if I wanted to basically stop, um, if I wanted to uh, basically stop uh, or control the amount of meter charges, meter credit usage I had per month, I could set a budget. I do want to point out there's um, times when budget's enforced and times when budget's not enforced. So a pool that has dedicated processor partitions, we can't enforce budget for that pool. Um, and that's because we have no way to enforce uh, dedicated partitions. We have no way to limit dedicated partitions from using uh, any resources that um, have been assigned to them. So we don't enforce budget for 
pools that contain dedicated processor for part partitions. But for pools that contain shared processor partitions only, we do enforce budget. So what that means is if you reach your 80 credits this month, we will actually start throttling back the core usage on the servers in the pool to get them back to their base to control uh, the metered usage so there's no more metered usage on those servers. And once you hit your 80 credit limit in this case, we would actually stop charging you for any metered usage. It does take us, we do take about four days to get you back to your base. So you do actually continue to have metered usage even after you've met your budget, we start throttling you, but we don't charge you for any of it once you've met that 80 credits. But that's only when budgets are enforced. So you may ask, why would I wanna set a budget for a dedicated pool? Well, because we offer these things called thresholds um, and alerts, right? So you can actually set up, you can come over here in the settings page, you can actually set up um, alerts for your pool, right? So here right now shows you all the in-app alerts we've received in this portal um or just enterprise pools so you can see them here but you can go in and you can actually configure and say i want to be emailed or i want to be texted when these uh, thresholds are reached so you can actually enter an email address and a phone number uh, to actually be texted um, if you want to actually be notified when these alerts are reached so you can do that and then you can go back and you can set up different alerts so go, we'll go down to the budget ones you can actually set up an alert that says, hey, notify, notify me when my meter usage reaches a percentage of my uh, current month's budget. In this case, I've, it's turned on and I set it to 75%. So I will get notified when 75% of my meter usage is met for that month. Now that notification works whether you're dedicated or not. So even if we don't enforce the budget, we can still notify you when you're close to reaching your budget. And of course, if you do actually reach your monthly budget, we actually will notify you automatically um, that you've actually met 100% of your budget. So you can actually use this to help you control your metered usage if you're concerned about, um, you know, wanting to make sure that you, you know, you're on top of it and it doesn't run off to some really high charges that you weren't expecting. So you can help use this, these mechanisms to help you um, understand, monitor, and control that. We also have a remaining credit balance um, alert that you can set up to notify you when you get low on your number of credits. Um, so that way you can make sure that you keep credits in your pool. We do allow you uh, to go below uh, your number of credits. We allow you to go below zero, but only for 30 days. If that lasts and you haven't replenished your credits within 30 days, we actually will start the core throttling to bring your server your uh, servers back to their base capacity to stop the metered usage um, since you don't have any credits anymore and you haven't replenished them. So you can use this um, alert to help you um, understand when you get low so you can go purchase some more credits. There's also alerts you can set up for um, thresholds uh, for system, uh, core usage thresholds, memory usage thresholds, and for also for partition uh, core usage thresholds. So those are all available here. And that was the alert we popped up was an alert that told us that a partition threshold was over, that a partition had reached our threshold that we set up here. Um, the other page I want to show you real quick, I've only got a few more minutes. So um, let me go back and show you the user statement page. Um, we actually just have a, introduced a new function. We actually allow you to email this uh, to whoever you want um, on a monthly basis. So at the beginning of each month, we will email you automatically the user statement for the previous month. So here is where you can see um, by month and by quarter uh, the credit usage across your pool. Um, it's broken down by the resource type and it's broken down by month. So you can see how many credits you use of each resource type uh, of each month. Okay, so you can get a consolidated view of your credit usage by type and by amount by month. Okay, so we are about at the end. I wanna um, see if anybody has any questions or anything that they want me to go back and explain more um, while I still have a few minutes. So do we have any questions? So while answer. people are maybe typing in questions specifically for you, um, Stephanie, I'm going to answer one. And there was a question in there about uh, converting, uh, you know, a non-PEP 2.0 to PEP 2.0. So if you purchase a system that's not PEP 2.0, you can convert that system, uh, Power 9 system, to PEP 2.0. Now, if you bought a G model scale-out system and you've paid for all the cores on that system when you bought it because it's not base, um, changing some of those cores to base probably isn't doing you any good because you, you don't get a refund for those, the cores that you paid for that, that aren't base cores um, if you do that. But say you buy another G model system, you can put one base core in that 
and then if you convert in your other G model to all base cores, you know, then then if you put them in a pool together, then all those resources will get you know shared in a pool. But I, I just want to say, if you bought say four S924 G model systems, you want to put them and and you didn't buy them with PEP 2.0, you're going to convert them and put them just in a pool by themselves. Probably not worth it because you know you've already activated all the on the cores on them. So there, there's nothing to share in that pool. Would only really make sense if you were adding. Um, other systems to it that you bought just like one base core on. Okay, so let me address um, some of these questions. Are you done, Joe, or do you want me? Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Okay, so I'm just going to go from the bottom up. Uh, no way of converting a nine S nine twenty two A model to EP two point and the answer is no. It has to be the G models only. Uh, we don't offer it on the A model. Um, is meter capacity cost normally classified as capex or opex? I believe it's normally opex. Um, most customers, I believe, use that as OPEX or classify that as OPEX. Dedicated LPARs. So, yes, they're supported in the pool. My point about dedicated LPARs is we can't throttle them. Okay, so we enforce budget by throttling, but because we can't throttle dedicated LPARs, we therefore can't enforce budget in pools with dedicated LPARs. Okay, so that's that was the statement about dedicated LPARs. But yes, they are supported. You just don't get budget enforcement. But again, you can still set up the alerts to get notified when you're when you're close to reaching your budget so that you can go in and take action. You can configure your LPARs or DLPAR, whatever you want to do to help control the usage, your metered usage at that time. Um, Stephanie, can you yes. explain the difference? Can you explain the difference between dedicated and dedicated donating, how we charge for that? Oh, good point, Michael. Yes, thank you. So if you are using dedicated partitions in a pool, you do want to set them up to be dedicated donating if at all possible. The reason being that you actually get credit for your idle cycles um, that your dedicated partitions have. So you basically will see uh, CPU usage in line with what you're actually using on that dedicated LPAR. If you set them up to be not dedicated donating, then we charge you at 100% CPU util utilization. Okay, because they are not donating any cycles. So since the uh, cores are assigned to those partitions there, we consider them used at 100%. So that that is the difference between those. Okay, what else do we have? Can we pull CMC data out by APIs? Not today, but we are looking at that. So hopefully we will have a, the ability to do that in the future, but not currently today. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Can, for moving all parts across systems in the pool, you can leverage Power VC. Um, Yes, you can do that. Systems or our LPARs can be, we do support LPM. You can, L, there's no restriction on an LPM in a pool. You can LPM partitions in and out of a pool, um, in and out off of servers in a pool is what I'm talking about, and that's fine. Uh, one thing I will note if you do LPM within a pool, uh, you do kind of get some credit because when you're doing LPM, uh, there are, there's usage um, by that partition on two systems at the same time for a period of time while the LPM is in progress. And if both those systems are in the same pool, you actually um, only get charged one time for that usage. So you don't get double charged while the LPM is in progress. So there is a little bit of a benefit if you're going in a pool, but there's no restriction on LPM. You can go in and out of a pool, no problem. Um, let's see, anything else I have that I didn't answer? Okay, it looks like we've really done pretty good there. Um... And we're, we're hit the the end of our time. So um, first of all, I, I want to thank Stephanie and and Michael and and Tom. Looks like there was a bunch of questions here. Look like uh, answers to all of them as I as I scroll through here. So um, really appreciate you guys being on top of that. That's that's fantastic. And um, and thank you, Michael, for the the information on that tool. I just want to stress everyone if you're thinking of PEP 2.0. This lab services tool is great, and um, and you should look into that, and, and it will really help with sizing it. And uh, thanks, Stephanie, for all your help with, with putting this together and doing the demo, answering questions. Uh, really appreciate that as well. Um, so with that, everybody, um, we're going to end the session here. And uh, thanks also to Tom for answering questions in the background. And um, I'll get out stuff for the uh, next month's VUG uh, when I get it all set up. And with that, I want to wish you all a, a happy summer and, uh, and a good July 4th weekend that's coming up.